There are few greater challenges than saving lives after serious injuries. You're shot, you have to go to the operating room. I'm Dr. Kevin Fong. I want to see for myself how lives are saved in some of the world's most extraordinary trauma centers. This guy stabbed in the chest with a screwdriver, he's fully arrested. Here we go. As a doctor, I've seen a lot. Hey! But you've never seen it all. I'll be joining ER doctors across the world who are amongst the best at dealing with extreme trauma from car crashes to stab wounds and gunshot victims. Did you get assaulted to or just shot? I've been given special access to get up close and see these elite teams in action to learn the lessons that might improve our own A&Es. I want to learn the secrets of these trauma units and how they manage to save lives that would otherwise be lost. I want to show you the world of trauma medicine through a doctor's eyes. This week, I'm back at home at King's College Hospital in South London. A car crash victim with multiple internal injuries fights for her life. She's got a right liver rupture, bilateral lung contusions, left displaced cavicular fracture, a fracture of the anterior first rib. A young boy is rushed to A&E with a suspected paralyzing spinal injury. Left or right? Left. <laughs> and a stab victim who's no stranger to emergency treatment in London's trauma units. What can look on the outside like a really superficial wound can be almost any depth and those people can die. This is Trauma the British Way. I'm in London to see how British doctors are fighting to save lives after terrible injuries. Around 10,000 people die after accidents or violence every year. But some reports estimate hundreds of lives could be saved if we had better resources and more trauma centres. How does the UK stack up against the rest of the world's elite trauma units? It's taken the UK a long time to wake up to the fact that when it comes to trauma care, we just need to be doing better. And so I've come here to King's College Hospital to see a new breed of trauma centre and the latest weapon in our fight for life. King's is one of only four hospitals in London recently chosen to take on the capital's most serious injuries a super centre with specialist teams and the latest technology. I used to work here on intensive care, and back then it wasn't considered a major trauma centre. But they've made a lot of changes in the last two years, and I'm fascinated to see what they've done with the place. I've just arrived to meet my friend Tom Best, uh, who's running trauma today, and uh, there's already a trauma in, so... What's going on at the moment? So this is a 62-year-old chap who stepped into the road to overtake some pedestrians and got hit by a bus from behind doing about 30. He apparently lost consciousness and he's got some tightness in his chest. Um, he's a little bit confused and suggested that he's got something going on in his head. David is a fashion photographer. The accident happened when he was hit by a bus in Brixton. A blunt trauma, pretty typical for this neck of the woods. Lots of energy, potentially lots of injuries. It's for the team to try and work out exactly what's going on, and that's what's, what's happening at the moment. A bit of pressing it just at the bottom of your tummy. Well done. We're going to go straight round to the CT scanner. We'll just do a scan from head down to his knees. Just five minutes after arriving in hospital, David is in the CT scanner, so the trauma team can find out rapidly if there's an immediate threat to his life. Has he got a significant head injury that needs surgical intervention? That's, that's the crucial thing. Is, is this a time-dependent head injury? If you all go into the room just around the corner... Yeah? 
of it is probably the quickest piece of diagnostic uh, equipment we have. Actually, the time to scan about two metres length of body is about 15 seconds. And those images come up on that screen real time. David has now been scanned from head to toe, and Tom can rule out serious brain damage. But he does find another problem. You see, with a little bit of asymmetry, perhaps, on that scanogram at the moment. Um, and I'd say on that room on the right, that looks a bit more black, so it's suggesting it could be collapsed lung, some blood actually in the lung itself. Obviously, something's wrong. You can see this bit is just air. If this air continues to expand, it will cause significant pressure on the blood vessels to the, to the extent that eventually it could induce a cardiac arrest. But the CT scan shows that he has got injuries to his chest. He has blood in the space between his lung and his chest wall, and he has some air in there as well. So pneumothorax, haemothorax, he's going to need a chest drain. This is uh, n another friend of mine, another Tom, Tom Koenig, and uh, I used to work with him. David, just a very small scratch coming, and then it will begin to go numb. The next thing that's going to happen, Tom will take the scalpel and make his incision, and he's just about to just there. Take a couple of deep breaths if you need to. That's it. Well done. Well done. Let a push him now. Don't be frightened. This is what is supposed to happen. Yeah. That's it. Well done. Hold my hand. So lots of air comes well bubbling done. out. That's All that air done. coming out, that's air under well under pressure from his chest as it comes well bubbling out. Take a deep breath in and out for me, David. <coughs> Brilliant. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, well done. done. Good. It's working. You've done really well. Um, that drain is now in, and that should prevent you getting further complications in that chest. It took under an hour to diagnose all David's injuries and give him the treatment he needed to get him out of danger. I was walking along the street towards Brixton Town Hall and um, I woke up in the hospital. I have a feeling that I was hit by the side mirror of one of these uh, double-decker buses. I had five fractured ribs. Uh, two fractured bones in my spine, 14 stitches in the back of my head, brain bruising. Naturally, I'm glad I'm still alive, you know. King's College Hospital in London is one of a new breed of UK trauma units, a specialist centre that will take all the most serious injuries for miles around. Yeah, yeah, about 15 minutes, lovely. Okay, fine, hold on. Okay. Adult, okay. trauma yeah. explain yeah. 15 minutes. I'll just put the trauma call out uh, in a couple of seconds. This is going to go off. Um, and that's the trauma call. My pager told me a new patient was arriving in the trauma bays, a car crash victim. The case was serious and complex and needed to be referred to King's. A woman involved in a car crash with multiple injuries. It would test them as a world-class trauma centre. So this is a patient who's come in from another hospital uh, and after a very, very serious car accident, been resuscitated, gone to surgery, but found to have a very serious liver injury, amongst other injuries, broken bones, chest injuries. What you're seeing here is not just the trauma team, but the cardiothoracic team and the liver team, and that's a very good example of this multidisciplinary approach needing to be engaged in this very complicated case. The night before, Evelina was on her way home after finishing a night shift. She was a passenger in a car which hit a lamppost at high speed. Ready, steady, and slide. The accident happened over 10 hours ago. Evelina is still on a ventilator. Drips are giving her fluids, and drains are releasing air and draining blood from her chest. Left displaced cavicular fracture. She's got a fracture of the anterior first rib, also a small left pneumothorax. She's got fracture of the right ribs and the first piece of the sternum. Heart rate, she's been tachycardic up to 130. 
Well, you heard that handover. A huge catalogue of information to said a lot of interventions. All of that information has to be passed on and understood so that they can get an idea of how sick she is, what still needs to be done, how stable she is, and whether or not she needs to go for further surgery here. There are more than 15 specialist doctors and nurses circulating around this bed, hunting for any missed injuries and trying to decipher the sea of information. It's a great example of King's team approach. Each specialist is doing a vital job. Some are searching for injuries, others are just focused on keeping Evelina alive. So if you see the person at the top there, that's the anaesthetist, uh, Rebecca, and she's got her work cut out for her here. The patient is currently supported with a ventilator. There's a tube being inserted to support her breathing. There are chest strains in. She's had an operation. And what's going through her mind at the moment is what further resuscitation is she going to have to do? And is she going to have to take her to theatre so that the surgeons can crack on and do more repairs? And what are you guys going to do now? The injury was at about 7 a.m. So really, we're just trying to go right back to the beginning again and make sure we haven't missed anything. So re-scan her to see if she's had any further injury. Also, to look at that liver to see where the bleeding is and to see if they can stop it. This is an evolving story. 11 hours after this, this event, it's still not clear whether all the problems have been addressed, whether all the life-threatening injuries have yet been identified and dealt with. And so that's what we're about to try and find out now. See, there's an area of contused kidney. Yeah. If I can get that, yeah, that's it. That's it. There's an area of contused kidney there. I mean, the more this picture builds up, the more you realise how how significant how, how significant this 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 crash was. I mean, she's she's got injured lungs, some, uh, lumbar spine, kidney, spleen, and liver very injured there. So uh, she's lucky to be this stable at this point. I think. Oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And the fact that she survived. Multiple injuries are common in traffic accidents. And while seatbelts save lives, the force of them against the body can also cause injuries. There are lots of vital structures in the abdomen. If we just look at me, this is my, as if a sternum, this is the bottom, really, of my breastbone. And if I sweep down, that's where my ribs lie and they go across here. And so the liver sits there under cover of the ribs. Without her seatbelt, Evelina would have died, but the impact of it against her body severely ruptured her liver. With her liver at risk of further bleeding, Evelina needs major surgery. She's been passed on to the liver team at King's. In Professor Nigel Heaton, King's has a world-renowned liver surgeon to call upon. He knows the dangers to the patient if such a difficult internal injury is not repaired. It's not the easiest organ to look after in the face of major hemorrhage. I think people are always fearful because it, it's such a vascular organ. There's so much blood going through it. You know, there's, a, there's almost a litre and a half of blood going through it each minute. So if you have uncontrolled bleeding, you, you, you get into a very difficult situation very quickly. Evelina's liver has been stuffed with surgical packs of cloth to try and stop it bleeding. So this is the moment of truth. They're taking the packs out, those packs that were sitting on the liver, pressing on it, stopping the bleeding. If there's no more hemorrhage, then they can close up, send her back to intensive care and hope that she makes a good recovery. If there is still bleeding around the liver, they're going to have to think of another plan. The next few hours for Evelina are going to be crucial. 
Evelina has been involved in a car accident late at night. She's been rushed to King's Specialist Trauma Unit from a smaller A&E because high-level specialist intervention is needed. She is currently in theatre, where renowned surgeon Professor Nigel Heaton is attempting to repair her damaged liver. And we'll have a look at the left side of the liver in a minute, and you'll see that. Her boyfriend is waiting anxiously for any news from the operating theatre. It's really, really terrible. I never feel like that before, yes, because she never was that terrible accident like now. But we are still waiting now, yeah, when she come back. You can see the rupture here. And there's quite a deep rent in the liver here. And the packing is all on the side, and it's been compressing the liver. And now we're just taking the pack out. It's just starting to bleed, so we're just trying to take the pack out. If the hemorrhage isn't stopped, Evelina could bleed to death. It's still bleeding. We will need a gauze roll, please. I'll probably need two gauze rolls. It's going to compress the liver into it. So I'm packing still, and you can see I'm pushing the right lobe of the liver over. You know, if you've got a cut on your hand, and you put a bandage on it and you just hold it, it stops the bleeding. And we're doing exactly the same thing. It's the right side of the liver that's really badly injured, uh, and there's a crush injury to a vertebra in the spinal column just behind all of that. Uh, so they're having a very good look uh, at all of the structures that lie in between uh, to try and make sure that she's going to be safe when they close up. And Prof. Eaton, it was, it was almost exclusively the right lobe that was injured, wasn't it? Yes, it is. I'm going to show you the left lobe. There is an injury extending into the left lobe, but just to try and show you, that's the left side of the liver here. There is a little tear just here. The gallbladder's here. The gallbladder marks a junction between the right liver over here and the left liver here. So you can see that's, that's um, a tear in the liver. You can see the liver tissue, the liver cells sort of poking out from the lining here. And, um, and here they put one more pack in here, just against the spleen, but there's a small tear in the spleen. We just want this to come out now. And then after that, we'll have a search to look for any other injuries. Thank you. They're just finishing up there. They've closed the abdomen. Uh, the liver is very significantly injured. The whole of the right side really shattered. But all of the other structures, importantly, that lie between the liver and the back appear to be OK. So she'll still have to have op other operations. They'll still need to go back again. But she's through the worst of it, and fingers crossed she'll make a full recovery. coming back from work and the driver lost the control. First thing that I did, I phoned my boyfriend and told him about an accident and I would like to see him right now. He thought I was joking, but then he heard an ambulance uh, sound horn. So he, then he realized it's not a joke and he came in like five minutes. Everyone is telling me that it is a miracle, that they can't believe that I look the way I look after having so many injuries. All the nurses are keep telling me this, really, you look very good, you're doing great. And all my friends are telling me that you're such a strong person, Evelina, really. It's like, we knew we were going to make it, we just knew we were going to make it. Now I know that lots of things doesn't matter, really. Uh, you need to just cherish your life because in one second you can lose everything. Trauma cases like Evelina's present huge challenges for doctors. Within minutes they have to assess exactly what the injuries are and their potential deadly implications. 
At King's, having the right tools and medical skills on hand, they can quickly evaluate and treat the multitude of cases that arrive by ambulance day and night. When you're able to take a step back from the trauma call, the whole thing feels a bit like a detective story. You're, you're kind of trying to look for that information, search for those clues that are going to put you on the trail of a killer, or at least a potential killer. The imaging, the CT scans, the x-rays, the examination, the history that you get, all of that is brought together like, you know, kind of like pieces of forensic evidence to try and get you to the answer that's going to help you save a life. Because King's is now a major trauma centre for the seriously injured, the flow of new patients and the workload is huge. All a &Es have to deal with sudden, unpredictable surges in demand. And no matter how much capacity you've got, it's never enough. It's absolutely heaving in there, and you're just about to see how difficult it is to practice trauma in this environment. Fiona is the senior nurse running Resus today. How are you going to cope with all of that? Um, we're going to see if we can move someone out to get phase 5 free pediatric A seven-year-old boy is on his way. He has a suspected spinal injury. Fiona has to clear the specialist paediatric bay to make way for this new case, which takes priority. So just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, this is another emergency call. It's a medical call, but it's another bed that needs to be occupied. Thank you very much. Bye. Six minutes. The volume of trauma coming through here is clearly increasing. This is Thursday. This isn't really supposed to be a busy day or time of day, and it's going to stretch them. I just want to let you guys know we have got another stroke coming in. Um, we're just absolutely full to capacity. Fiona swiftly deals with the situation. P bay into four. New straight patients going into two. In just five minutes, Fiona has completely reorganised Resus to deal with the incoming surge of trauma cases. Trauma medicine demands a lot of those who work in A and E, close to the critically injured. What drives you to do it? What makes you? want to be good at it, do it. I just really love it. That's really sad, but I do really enjoy it. I love not knowing what's coming through the door. I love the busy days where you're really stressed out and you're just trying to make everything function. And, and you enjoy the trauma more than the other bits of it, or...? It would be false for me to say I don't enjoy trauma because there is a buzz and a satisfaction from managing the multi-injured patient and working out what's wrong and all working together to make that patient better. That is a real enjoyable part of the job. But at the same time, the worst thing about trauma is that it affects all spectrums of ages and there's no rhyme or reason to it. It makes you realise how frail life can be. And I think you wouldn't be human if you didn't take that on board, that people's life can be snapped out so quickly. Trauma, a &E. The next patient is here. Seven-year-old Lewis has fallen from a trampoline. Because there are signs that his injury could be serious, an ambulance has brought him and his mum and dad all the way from Kent. We'll just get as few people in with the kid as possible so they don't get too stressed and stand you down as quick as I can. Do we don't have an anaesthetist yet. Emergency consultant Ema is a paediatric specialist. Lewis. Lewis's dad. Hi, I'm Emma. I'm consultant in charge. Hi, Steve. You stay nice and close to him so he doesn't get too stressed out, yeah? Lewis has signs suggesting a possibly serious injury to his spinal cord. Lewis was playing on a trampoline with some um, like family friends, during which they were sort of wrestling, and he sort of landed forward like that on his head. Starts complaining of pain around C5. OK. Um, and also to find the pins and needles in his legs. OK. Have you 
got any medical problems at all? Anything like asthma? OK. Consultant Tom Best assists on the case, helping in the initial examination. OK, we're just going to examine you. Make sure you haven't injured yourself anywhere. OK, so we're just listening to the chest. And you're, and, OK, we're going to have a good look at you. All right, good. Everything's difficult when it comes to paediatric trauma, when it comes to treating children. Physiologically, they tend to hide their injuries for longer, so you really have to be watching them like a hawk to make sure you haven't missed anything, because by the time it becomes obvious they're seriously injured, it's just too late. And then on top of that, there's the, the emotional side of it. There isn't anyone who doesn't find this difficult. Uh, there isn't anyone who doesn't dread the, the paediatric trauma call, no matter how long you've been doing it. Okay. Lower abdomen, left hip. Femurs are not tender. Okay. Brilliant, man. The team is looking systematically for any information that might reveal the true nature of Lewis's injuries. Is that painful at all? You don't touch it. Where? Which side? Left or right? Left. The worry here is that he's damaged. Uh, his uh, spinal column and his spinal cord. Uh, he was complaining of tingling in his legs, which is quite worrying. And so the challenge here will be uh, for the team to have a good look at him and make sure that he doesn't have any serious injuries. He's just having those difficulties of really telling us what does and doesn't hurt. We just make sure there's nothing else to worry about, and then we'll get to the neck. Is he still complaining of tingling in his legs? To be honest, I haven't got to that. I'm more working my way down, just doing the system, just do the system every time, and then you don't miss something by jumping to the obvious thing first. And this hip. That tingling sensation can be a sign of damage to the spinal cord, which in extreme cases could lead to paralysis. Steady, steady. Seven-year-old Lewis has been rushed to King's College Hospital with a potentially paralysing spinal injury. His head was caught between his cousin's legs and then they all went down. Yeah? OK. Did he get up or did he stay on the ground? No. As soon as he started crying, he was saying about his neck. Yeah. So I held him. Kept him down. OK, that's fine. OK, thank you. Can you feel me touching you there? He has the full attention of the entire trauma team. Okay. That's fine. Come and have a little feel of this neck, because your neck was annoying you when you first fell, wasn't it? And did your legs feel a bit funny? Do they still feel funny or have they gone back to normal? A little bit funny. A little bit funny. Within minutes, another specialist, an orthopaedic surgeon, joins the team. No nodding, just Any yes pain or no. Those? Yes or no? Pain there? Don't yeah, know, Just say yes or no. Yes. OK. And there? Yes. There? Quite localised, isn't it? Yes, like C3, C4. OK, lovely. Should we get everything back on, then? How worried are you about him? He may have something in his neck. I don't think he's got anything in the rest of his spine. I won't know until I get my x-rays back. All right. There's now an agonising wait while Lewis is taken to radiology so his spine can be examined in detail. Lewis's x-rays are back from radiology, but they don't provide the reassurance Ema was hoping for. You can see that the nice smooth arch steps out here and it also steps out there. And this is the point at which he had his pain but it's not straightforward. In an adult, that would definitely be abnormal. But it, that, in a child, that could just reflect the slightly more relaxed ligaments. Children don't often injure their necks. Uh, and we're very fortunate in this situation that the nerves running through the neck all seem to be fine. He's, the pins and needles that he had sound more like they were due to being frightened. Um, the power and the sensation running through his neck seems to be absolutely normal now. Yeah. So if this is something, it's a bone or ligament thing that can be fixed. Yeah. Um, but the occasional child does injure their neck properly and that's why we have to be very cautious, which is why we've kept the collar and the blocks and the tape on until we know it's absolutely safe. To make sure, Ema asks another specialist, a neurosurgeon, 
to examine Lewis. His cervical spine lateral film is abnormal. It will, it may well turn out to be pseudo subluxation. It's in the right place, but it's absolutely on the spot where he's got point tenderness. Okay, it will be coming through shortly. The images are coming up now. So there's another difficult wait while the neurosurgeon analyzes the x-rays for himself. So what's your name? Lewis. Let's just get you in there and we'll have a chance. Mum and Dad, do you want to come in? You're all right. Then the neurosurgeon is ready to see Lewis. What I want to do now is I want to get you to sit up. I want to take that collar off. I want to move your neck. Tell me if it hurts a lot, all right? Let's have you sitting up then, come on. This is quite uncomfortable, isn't it? There we are. There we go. That's a good one. What? Uh, uh, there we go. Show me. There? What about there? That's all right, is it? Yeah, that's all right. And look to this side, to your right, that's it. And to your left now, all the way. Very good. We've had a look at the x-rays that we've done. Everything... Ah, you don't need to keep doing that, all right? <laughs> <laughs> um, the x-rays we've done, and we've got him to sort of bend his neck up and down, yeah. that looks absolutely fine. Okay. Kids will always have a bit of movement in their spine, the bones, okay? Yeah. It'll show a tiny bit of movement. That's because their ligaments are still very young and very tough. That's good news, isn't it? Right. Okay. What's your side to him? Thank you. Good boy. Take care. You're all okay? It's pretty good. You might be able to go to school tomorrow now. There's a downside yeah. to everything, yeah, mate, I'm it. afraid. <laughs> So a big day for Lewis, uh, falling off the trampoline out there in Kent, brought all the way here by ambulance, uh, and then worked up. And for a while there, it wasn't entirely sure that he was going to be all right. But they got those investigations very quickly, very efficiently. They got that specialist neurosurgical opinion. And the best thing of all is, within a few hours of having arrived, he goes home tonight knowing everything's going to be all right. Undoubtedly, it is very distressing when they've got their parents there with them, so you've got more people to try and support through it. My children don't have a trampoline. My children don't drive their scooters in the road. My children wear helmets for everything. Because in my world, that's real. I see kids who run out in front of between cars several times a week, so I know that that happens to real children, so I'm determined that I try and stop it happening to mine. But trauma does happen to children and sometimes there's bad news to deliver. Since I've been doing more of the trauma shifts, I've had to tell two mothers that their teenage sons have been stabbed to death. And it definitely affects you. It affects you for days or weeks. It affects you at home. You're incredibly nice to your own children for a couple of days afterwards. Friday afternoon at King's College Hospital. The more time I spend here, the more I'm struck by how many violent cases this place now sees. Far more than when I worked here before. What are you expecting this to be like today? Um, probably on a Friday, hot Friday afternoon. Normally, probably start getting a few stabbings or shootings coming in. Um, yeah, really? <laughs> probably, yeah. How, li how likely do you think that is? You, obviously, there's no predicting what's going to come through the door, but you often find if it's quite sunny and nice outside, everyone's out and about and maybe bump into somebody yeah. that they're not yeah. particularly friendly with. It's a beautiful evening here in South London. The doctors and nurses tell me that the good weather tends to bring bad news when it comes to trauma. There's an increase in the violent crime they see and the violent trauma. And unfortunately, they aren't wrong. Hello, Kings. Trauma red on five minutes. Trauma red on five minutes. There's a trauma call coming in, uh, and they're expecting a stabbing in the next three minutes. And penetrating trauma has its own unique challenges, and it's going to be very interesting to see how the team managed to deal with that. So 
30 minutes ago, a young man was attacked. He's been rushed to King's with multiple stab wounds. Three wounds, arterial bleed, which we need to plan with three digits in the squeeze them. Two wounds on the back, so we need to no matter what to do. Can I take for a second? No. Last time I was in the hospital, they took everything off me. Everything that's in my pocket. No, oh, sorry, sorry. This one is pissed. I don't even want to see it, sorry. Can you give us some more feet? Can I clap? Sorry. Yes, I'm going to clap. Okay. Oh, I can remove my... <laughs> there are two stab wounds to the patient's back. The knife could have penetrated through to his internal organs. There's a danger that blood or air could be building up inside his chest, and that could stop his lungs or even his heart from working. That wound's quite deep. Okay. Um, I've probed it. The consultant tonight is Andre. Back home in South Africa, he's seen more than his fair share of stabbings. So we're going to just get a chest x-ray to make sure that there's no, that none of the stab wounds at the back have also made holes in your lungs or anything like that. It's nothing major. I've been stabbed before now. I've got stabbed like nine times that time. All of my legs are like that. Like there, there. I've got the same on this side. Loads of times. He looks OK at the moment, but it's easy to get lulled into a false sense of security with a case like this. Uh, young people give the appearance of being very stable until the very last moment. X-ray bay three. And so you always have to stay on top of it to make sure there's nothing more sinister going on. I took off my shirt, wrapped my shirt around my ankle. It's the biggest one. That one's all cut my flipping... You nearly cut an artery and it's cut my, what do you call it, tendons? Yeah, that's why I can't really move my... I can't move my fingers in it. Every time there's a stabbing, the, the whole trauma service here gets activated. It's one of the sort of things that will kick it all off. Why is that? Because you can never tell. What can look on the outside like a really superficial wound can be almost any depth and can penetrate almost any structure. Those people can die. And it's easy to get it wrong because you can't tell by looking. So this is his chest x-ray and you've just yeah. done an ultrasound. Yeah. How are things looking at the minute? Things looking pretty good at the moment. It looks completely normal with normal lung fields. So he's just got lucky. Wow. He's got a significant injury in his left arm uh, that will be a problem, but the ones that could have been life-threatening uh, haven't penetrated deeply enough to hit anything important, so he's got away with it today. And, and I mean, it's been two, three years since I've been here. It certainly didn't seem to be quite as much of this sort of stuff coming through. Has it, has it really changed? It's, I think there's a lot more stabbing going on, and it's, it's underreported. You, you just don't see this stuff hitting the press anymore. You know, more kids are dying in London, in this, this part of London, than any other, you know, from stab wounds than anywhere else in this country. But when you're 16 years old, you think you're immortal, you, you know. When it's your day, it's your day. That's all I can say. If, if I was meant to die, I would have died. You know what I mean? You don't get to choose who you treat. You don't know what's coming through that door, what injuries they're going to have. It's not your job to decide who deserves care and who doesn't. You just do the best that you can for whatever arrives, whenever it arrives, 24-7. Uh, and that makes it very simple in a way, and it's what makes the job the job that it is. Uh, and it's something to celebrate, I think. Over the past week, I'd witnessed the King's team deal with an incredible variety of challenges. Their new approach to trauma seems to be paying off. Trauma red phone, two minutes. Trauma red phone, two minutes. My time at King's Trauma Center is nearly over. Have you stabbed? Have we got regular At this point in time, things are looking great. Yeah. It's it's not free. But it probably it's probably not, but for where it is, it, even sometimes these these kinds of injuries, they can be little on the outside and you just don't know what's damaged underneath. One of my former colleagues, Dr. Tom Koenig, is on duty. 
Tom's CV includes working with military trauma teams in Afghanistan. How is this gentleman? I think he's fine. I mean, he's, he's, he says he's been stabbed with some scissors, but looking at the wound, it's dry. There's certainly no air bubbling in and out of it. He'll get his chest x ray to look if he's got a, a pneumothorax. Uh, if he hasn't and he remains well as he is, we'll try and get him away tonight, really. Otherwise, we'll keep the ward awake. Violent trauma appears to be on the rise here. And even for Tom, the scale of the problem is surprising. You know, you've got quite a lot of experience with penetrating mm. chest trauma from your yeah. time in the military. Yeah. Uh, and this is kind of slightly far cry from what you're seeing at Camp Bastion, yeah. isn't it? I mean, we don't see a lot of, of thoracic injuries, certainly because of, certainly in our own troops and coalition troops, because they wear body armor. Um, but you do get it in the locals and those who don't wear body armour. Second last week, Dave Brown. I think with the number of stabbings that we're getting and that sort of the gangland crime that we see uh, and the fight for territory, it almost is akin to a war zone now, um, which is worrying for uh, our own capital city, where we all live and work. In the last few weeks, I've visited trauma units around the world and seen how medics there cope with serious injuries. You're shot, you have to go to the operating room. I need you to relax, OK? And here at King's, they too are taking trauma seriously. Talking, breathing, walking without it. The hospital is a changed place. The trauma centre has made all the difference. Just before I left, I met up with another oh, A&E consultant yeah. who I knew from my time yeah, yeah. here. Good. Long time you see? Yeah. <laughs> when you walk through those doors at the minute, it's the same place. And it organisationally, it's night and day. I mean... The change is massive, and we've definitely, 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 without a doubt, saved lives by sort of having a consultant-led service and having all the support structure that, that's now come of that. So having trauma surgeons here, having a CT scanner. And we're starting to see a difference. Well, hopefully someone will give you a hell of a lot more money to build a new uh, resource space. What's going on in there? Is that heading? Not yet. Oh, is it, or the build already yeah. started? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll I'll show you in a minute. All right. You might be able to see in a bit. Just show me now. Come on. Have you got it? <laughs> Stick your head right close to it. You can see I've absolutely gutted it, taking the ceiling down. Oh, my God. It's Again. really happening. We're going to extend into Fracture Clinic, increase the size of our minors area, increase the size of our paediatric area. So it's, it's all good news. The A&E redesign means that David, the pedestrian who was hit by a bus, was whisked into the CT scanner just minutes after his arrival. I'm glad I'm still alive, you know. So uh, that's uh, a plus point, you know. And I saw that the team was led each time by a dedicated trauma consultant, an expert in making the rapid decisions that these cases require. And when needed, the trauma team accelerates patients straight to theatre to get the life-saving surgery they need. Evelina's case showed me the team here can take on complex cases with multiple injuries, identifying and successfully treating even the most life-threatening amongst them. And Lewis, the small boy with a suspected spinal injury, was rapidly cleared of serious injury and was able to leave with his parents reassured on the same day. And to your left now? Or... Yeah, there's a little right. Okay. What's your side to him? Thank you. Take care. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of trauma is, is the system. It's how the system works. It's not whether you've got any expensive or fancy kit. It's the, it's the staff that are driving it. And it's understanding the system, understanding how trauma works as a disease as well. Our target is to make sure our trauma patients have better outcomes. That's, that's simply our target. And there is no reward or, or anything in it for us, but it's, it's actually quite satisfying. And, and it's interesting. It's no two trauma patients are the same. They're all different. They all pose different challenges. And, and that's part of the, the 
I, for want of a better word, the, the, the thrill of it. You know, you just don't know what, what's going to happen. It was the end of my week here, and what I'd seen was King's College Hospital growing into its new role as a leading UK trauma centre. They have managed it somehow. You see them in the middle of a trauma call where the difference in what they do is the difference between whether or not someone lives or dies. And you realise that it has changed and, and the culture of the place has changed, their approach to trauma has changed, the sense of purpose they have in the trauma call is there in a way that it never really was before. And you can legitimately say that what they've done here saves lives.